ready? Good morning, everybody. How are you? Um, so it's July 22nd, uh, but for all practical purposes, it might as well be January 22nd. That's because as far as the budget goes, uh, we are essentially back to square one. Uh, the governor's rejected nearly our entire budget. At the same time, the governor never gave us a real budget, a balanced plan that could pass. So rather than fight over proposals that aren't going anywhere, I'd like to suggest that uh, we hit the reset button and start over. So I'm here today to call upon the governor to submit a new balanced budget to the General Assembly, a plan that reflects the budgetary lessons we've learned over the past few months. Over a year and a half ago, I stood at this, in this very room and offered candidate Rauner a challenge, get specific about your budget plans. He never took me up on that, but no, nonetheless got elected, and so he now is the governor. So, and that challenge of balancing the budget became a constitutional requirement. The governor does deserve credit for submitting a plan on time, but there was a problem with his plan. It wasn't balanced. Um, as many of you reported at the time, his plan started with a $2.2 billion revenue shortfall. The governor sought to bank savings from a pension plan uh, before it was approved by the legislature and the, ju and the uh, judicial branches. Additionally, the budget assumed savings from programmatic changes that needed federal or court approval, which the governor never sought. This was played out in recent weeks as courts stepped in to reinforce consent decrees and other orders to keep numerous programs and services afloat, even though there's no budget. At the end of the day, the governor's budget was nearly $6 billion in the hole. He had pension reform, as I mentioned, $2.2 billion, unconstitutional. He cut proposed cutting Medicaid by $1.5 billion. Problem was required change in state law and federal approval, and no one even introduced a bill. He wanted to eliminate college insurance program and teachers' retirement insurance program to save $113 million. Nobody introduced the bill. He wanted to cut group health insurance by $570 million. That would be subject to his collective bargaining with the unions. That's uh, still on, on hold. He wanted to propose cutting uh, funding for local governments, $913 million. Nobody even put a bill in to do that. And he wanted to cut dedicated human service programs by $492 million. The problem is it violated consent decrees, judicial orders, and some state and federal laws. So not only was the governor's plan not balanced, it was unconscionable and it was unworkable. Uh, governor Rauner's plan included proposals that will undermine access to health care, child care, affordable college and retirement security for hardworking middle class families. These programs provide many of the work supports and opportunities that families need to succeed and respond to the economy. It didn't reflect the priorities of the majority of the General Assembly and the people that were elected to serve. So we offered a budget. It, we crafted it ourselves, one that protected the interest of the middle class and vulnerable populations. It was a lean budget, 1% growth from the previous year that included some of the governor's recommended funding levels and cuts. Still, we knew that the budget plan couldn't be complete until we had complementary revenue reform to address the nearly $4 billion shortfall. We were honest about that from the start uh, and from the beginning, and we invited the Republicans and the governor that shared our priorities to work with us on crafting a complete budget solution. The governor rejected that offer, vetoed the plan. So that brings us here today. His plan is dead. Our plan is dead. Let's acknowledge that and let's start moving forward. The governor's task won't be nearly as hard as his first plan because this time many of the decisions have been made for him. $23.5 billion of the budget is already being spent. It's over 60% of the budget. $15 billion in cost are left to fund or cut. If you look at this chart, you'll see what's already being spent. Pensions for teachers are being paid automatically. Teacher health care costs are being paid. Debt service is being paid. The money that goes to local governments and mass transit is being paid. Department of Children and Family Services are being paid by, by a court order. Human service programs tied to consent decrees are being paid. State employee salaries are being paid by court order 
and the governor signed the budget for education, the K through 12. What's still left to be appropriated are Medicaid. And remember, Medicaid is a liability under current law. Group insurance, that's the part I talked about, where we have an obligation to pay, but we need a new contract to get savings. The entire higher education budget hasn't been appropriated. There's grants to uh, schools to pay for assessments for uh, tests that hasn't been appropriated. There's human service programs that are not tied to consent decrees that have not been appropriated. These would be things like respite care for disabled kids and their parents. And there's other state programs, primarily probation services, that have not been appropriated. So we're calling upon the governor to uh, make these make these uh, these proposals. How does he want to spend the money that's remaining on those programs? So working with uh, the Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability, we would project we would have a 33 billion dollars, a little over 33 billion dollars in revenue available for us to spend in 20, in fiscal year 16. So if we were just to look at the spending that's happening now, the revenue hole would be over uh, $5.3 billion. Uh, we think that uh, we have the possibility of cutting some of the Medicaid cost and saving money. We talked about the group health cost that could be saved through the negotiations. So as a result, we believe we have a gap of about $4 billion. Now, the reason why the uh, budget is so important is that the governor spent his time in office prior to, prior, prioritizing a corporate agenda that will satisfy his corporate friends. Well, some of these ideas are worthy of debate. The governor has been unable to provide one shred of evidence that his agenda as, adds one cent to the ledger for our budget crisis in the short term or to elevate our credit rankings in the long term. So credit rating agencies have been clear. They have repeatedly referenced specific factors that will move Illinois from its current status as a state with the lowest credit ratings in the, in the country. We need revenue to address structural deficits, they say. We need constitutional pension reform, and we need to deal with our bill backlog. So the governor has chosen to hold the budget hostage to a corporate agenda. We risk further downgrades and eroding confidence in our state. The rating agencies aren't asking for collective bargaining changes or policy changes unrelated to the budget. They're doing the math on our budgets. They're looking at income and liabilities, and that's where our focus ought to be. Now, this bill backlog is really important. One area of fiscal policy that rating agencies and businesses uh, look to in Illinois, uh, they want stability. Businesses want stability, and they, uh, they want to know that there's predictability in being a vendor in the state. It's a budget issue. From fiscal year 11 to fiscal year 14, our budgets paid down our bill backlog by billions. According to information from the governor's office on management of the budget, our backlog grew as high as $9.3 billion in fiscal year 12. By the end of fiscal year 14, that number had dropped to $3.8 billion. But according to the governor's office of managing the budget, this bill backlog has started to climb again, and our unbudgeted and our unresolved budget makes it worse. So leaving the fiscal 16 budget unresolved and relying upon the current status quo could force the backlog up to over $14.5 billion this time next year. So the governor's priorities shouldn't be forced at the expense of our duty to pass the state budget, pay our vendors, and provide services. So I would suggest we stop the sideshows and focus on the fixes that the rating agencies say that we need. So we are willing, especially in the Senate Democratic Caucus, we have a working supermajority, we're willing to have uh, conversations with the governor on how to compromise. We're willing to do that. But we need to have a balanced budget. So I'm asking the governor to take this opportunity, submit a credible and balanced plan that will address our short-term crisis, shore up our credit rating in the long term. We're going to go back to Springfield August 4th, it's my hope that there can be compromises before that time. We need to hit the reset button so we can move forward with a resolution. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Why are you today? And Speaker Madigan has been having weekly press conferences. The governor has been out also. 
Why, why today? We passed the budget uh, last time we were in session to uh, pay for critical services through August 1st. Uh, we are in, in anticipation. That's on his governor's desk. He can sign that. The most important thing the governor does is sign a budget. He's vetoed past budgets. He's not even acted on the budget we put on his desk. Uh, we have this uh, chart here showing you that 60% of the budget's already gone out the door, and we need to focus on the next 40%. We're going back in after August 1st uh, to see if we can appropriate more money to pass a budget. And that's why I'm here to suggest to the governor we need to hear from him. If we don't hear from him, there's until August 1st, there's a bill we put on his desk, and he's got to act on it. John, as a matter of practical politics, doesn't the governor lose his bargaining leverage with you, his ability to get your caucus in the House Democrats to consider some of these changes that they don't like and approve some of them? Doesn't he give away all that leverage if he signs off on a budget? Well, you can't hold the state budget hostage for those items. We, we're, we've been talking to him about those items. We are willing to work with him on workers' comp. We're willing to work with them on uh, the uh, uh, property tax freeze. Uh, I've advanced a bill, which I hope we can pass when we go back to uh, enact the property tax freeze. Uh, but the most important thing we do is pass a budget, and he's got to understand that. And we're willing to work with them on those other items, but the budget's the number one priority. And we don't want to get downgraded even more than we already are, and that's what's going to happen if we don't pass a balanced budget. John, have you ever seen this happen before with past governors? I mean, what's this? I'm, you know, I've been the president of the Senate for seven years. And what we've been doing in those seven years is paying down old debt, as I talked about. Uh, we've been taking on the unions when it's appropriate. Uh, we've been trying to pass balanced budgets uh, and improve our uh, economy, which has happened. And so this is a divided government. I'm open to I understand that willing to work with Republicans. We're in overtime now, and we have to focus on what our job is. Yeah, what is to pass the tax? Balance budget. What about the tax? about the tax that Rauner is doing in, in public on? They're obviously not helpful. Uh, we want to compromise with people. Uh, he's never been here before. He's never done this. He's never been in government. Uh, he's got to learn that this is not the private sector. And, uh, we're, we're, we all have a role to play. We're willing to work with him and compromise. Why can't the Democrats just marshal supermajorities in both houses to either Veto uh, to override the governor's veto or pass revenue changes on their own without the governor's involvement. Well, we did override the governor's veto in the Senate with our working supermajority. We don't have the votes to uh, raise revenue. That's why we're asking him for his proposals. Or if he's got four billion dollars worth of cuts in this budget that we want to hear from. Him. Nobody even introduced a bill to pro provide any cuts. He couldn't get one Republican to introduce a bill. So that's why it's time for him to finally give us a balanced budget. Senator, when the uh, governor stands in front of the microphones, he makes it sound very simple. All the Democrats have to do is approve a handful of bills that he says he wants to see before he can talk about revenue. Why isn't it that simple? Because the handful of bills are pretty uh, radical bills. And, and or he's not aware of the, the issues that they deal with. For example, workers' compensation. He seems to be unaware of the fact that we passed a major workers' comp bill four years ago. His own workers' comp commission issued a report a few months ago uh, documenting the dramatic reduction in premiums and, and the reduction in benefits to workers. Uh, if he's got some more ideas, we're open to talking to him about it. And, you know, this agenda, this anti-union agenda, is just not supported not only by our caucus, but by a number of people in his own caucus. And it doesn't relate to the state budget. And as a result, the most important thing we do is pass a state budget, and you can't hold it hostage for these, these, these uh, unrelated budgeted uh, agendas. Mr. President, can you respond to his repeated observation yesterday that lawmakers continue to be paid during all of this and that... Yeah, he's probably not aware of the fact that that came about as a result of two court decisions. Well, we know how it came about, but the fact that the irony exists. Well, it's the court rule. It is not irony. It's, it's something that the court ruled that because of separation of powers, you can't have a situation where the executive <coughs> branch, like Governor Quinn, holds up people's salaries in, or, in, in order to force them to vote for a bill. And so that he forced us to sue. The judge ruled that uh, you can't do that. And that's why we're, we're receiving, just like the rest of the state employees are receiving our, our, our salaries. But it's bad PR, huh? 
Well, unfortunately, it's the Constitution. And I think you would understand that if we didn't like some judicial decision, and we said, oh, Supreme Court, you're working for a dollar now, that that would obviously not be a part of the separation of powers. It's the same principle with the, with the legislature. How long what do you, uh, how long do you fear this could go on? I think the bond rating agencies are critical. Uh, that might be a language he understands. And we're already lowest in the nation. We don't have to be at all. There's a, a solution to this budget crisis. Uh, working together, we can come up with uh, either the cuts or the revenues. We want to work on this. We've been wanting to work on it from day one. He just has had these sideshows that are not focused on the most important thing the state does. So you said that the rating agencies, you know, are also focused on pension reform. What? what yeah. What, what about? I'll be happy to talk to you about pension reform. Mm -hmm. I sat down with the governor for an hour and a half. I brought my lawyer in. I went through the Supreme Court decision, which I obviously had predicted before. It was unanimous. It was unconstitutional. We had passed that bill only because we needed a test case to prove to the rest of the world that it was the pension clause says what it says. And so we have a presented to the governor a constitutional pension reform bill that will save a billion dollars a year starting two years. But and we gave it to him. And he took it and said that's very interesting. And he came back with his own pension bill, which is just as unconstitutional as the last one. So I don't know what else I can do. And by the way, I had negotiated a pension bill, you may recall, with the unions, mm -hmm. with their support. The people who were the plaintiffs in the lawsuit had signed off on our bill, which never got called in the, in the House. And now that they've won in court, the unions are against uh, any pension reform. So whenever the governor and the Republicans want to sit down and talk about a constitutional pension reform bill, over the objections of the unions, I'd be more than happy to work with them. So, Ms. Ms. Uh, on the pay raise, back to that, what their argument is, yes, getting paid, but as far as a raise, they uh, say... Yeah, the raise is part of the Supreme Court decision and the Jorgensen decision. If people want to give their pay raises, their COLAs back, they're more than happy to do it. And that's what's happened. A number Thank of the people are doing that. Thank that you. was a Supreme Court decision said that the COLAs are part of your, of your package. And, they, and, this, and the... Another court decision said that these are part of your, your salary cannot be diminished, can't be changed during your term. How many so, of your caucuses do you have? You know, when you think about this budget, you can understand how that's a diversion, that the governor is talking about that instead of passing the budget. So that's why I'm here today. I want you to, guys to realize 60% of the budget has already been passed. The other 40% is right here. And the Medicaid bills are already being accrued because it's a liability. So are group insurance. I think we ought to fund our institutions of higher ed, and we've got to do this, and that's what we're focused our attention on. And the rating agencies don't care about, you know, collective bargaining issues and uh, workers' comp, and that's why we're here. So what, what is the yes, communication? Uh, yes, ma'am. The governor's office has just put out a statement in response to this, saying that. Before I even finished? Yes. <laughs> that, that, yes. That's, uh, that's not great. Yeah, you want to um, saying that they want to, to focus on passing his turnaround agenda. So you guys are just talking past each other at this point. We will focus on uh, working with the governor on his turnaround agenda, as we have all year. So workers' comp, tort um, uh, reform issues, uh, property tax freeze. We'll go back down and try to pass that bill again. Uh, Anything else he wants to talk about? Well, yeah, well, the, 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 statement, it's the statement says President Collard has made clear today that his view of a balanced budget is a budget that makes no spending reforms, no pension reform, and only raises taxes. President okay, we're not proposing. Forward, backward to the failed tax and spend policies of the past, we urge President Collard to work with us to pass meaningful structural reforms. Well, good. I'm, I guess we must have given a copy of this to him before we came here. <laughs> and we're not calling for a tax increase, we're asking for him to tell us how to balance this budget. The pension reform that we gave him is constitutional, the one he gave us back is not. Uh, we're willing to work with him on those other items. Uh, he, does, he hasn't even, if he's talking about cutting uh, part of this budget, maybe he can get somebody to introduce a bill. What's what, the, what is the communication level of the governor's office? Anytime he calls me and asks for a meeting, I go. When was that? When? A couple of weeks ago talked about 
property tax freezes. I spent an hour with them, and I went through the whole reason why property tax bills are high, primarily because we're last in the nation in providing funding for schools from the state. We talked about how his property tax bill is, you know, two-thirds of the suburban's property tax bills for education. I said we are willing to push a bill for a property tax freeze, but we have to take care of the poor school districts. The wealthier school districts, like his, New Trier, has $80 million worth of surpluses. So there's a, another reason why the property tax bills are high. And we also have a problem with the pension system, where we, the state, pays for the pension cost, the employer cost, for his suburban school districts. So these are nuanced. And you can't just use a bumper sticker from when you're running for governor and then start governing that way. You have to be engaged, and you have to make compromises and proposals. That's what we've been willing to do. Yes, sir. What, what do you want him to just take off the table in terms of his agenda? Because there are union proposals that seem to be just things that Democrats just can't support. So what, do you, what would you say to him, just get rid of this You know, right he almost now. lost his primary because of union. Because he didn't know that there's Republicans in Illinois who are pro union And so uh, he doesn't have any support for his proposals in his own party, other than the uh, intimidation of having a bunch of money. So uh, there's just, there's just not, it's not going to happen. But he wants, for example, to take away collective bargaining rights because he wants to lower property taxes. Well, we explained to him there's other reasons why property taxes are high, and there's other things you can do to lower property taxes. So here's an example of a conversation with him. Workers' comp, totally unaware of the bills that we passed, and unaware of the fact that his own workers' comp agency has documented the re major reductions, 22% the largest reductions in premiums in the nation in the last four years. So those are examples of how this is governing a little more different than just campaign, and that's what he seems to be. So, Mr. President, right? nothing's really changed then. What's uh, changed other, is other than budget. you're asking yeah. For a reset, yeah. you've, your positions are still the same. That no, I'm talking about compromise. I'm talking about on this budget. We've got, a, we've got these expenditures that have to be appropriated. We haven't appropriated them. He's veto. Okay? We have a temporary uh, budget uh, appropriation on his desk. Expires August 1st. We have to go back in and work on the budget. We have to appropriate. I'm asking him to give us his proposal. And we've got a couple weeks before we go back down. That's enough time to do it. On uh, these other items that he talks about as his agenda, that he's holding the budget hostage on, I'm telling you. We don't want to hear about I'm that. Telling, no, I told you we were, we're more than happy to. But, but now, there's very few things when you start off with these really, the speaker calls them extreme, radical. I agree with that. We can always do incremental things. But he has not moved at all off those things. In the meantime, he's vetoing budgets. And then soon, going to have our state be downgraded. And he's so concerned about being competitive with the rest of the, uh, you know, the rest of the states around us, we're not going to be competitive if we get downgraded. What are the odds of getting all parties to agree soon to have a financial crisis at CPS on some sort of pension relief for CPS? Pension relief for teachers, for Chicago, uh, for, for uh, picking up the normal costs of, of CPS. Yeah, that's, that's that was in the property tax freaks bill that I'm going to call again when I go back down to Springfield. Provided half a billion dollars worth of relief for the Chicago Public Schools. 197 million would be to pay for the normal cost. The remainder was a change in the uh, in the ramp for two years, and it would avoid 3,000 teacher layoffs. And I'm going to try to pass that. What, what's going to be different this week, this time? Do you have more members that will be? Here I'm going to hopefully get some people who voted no to vote yes. And hopefully, we'll On maybe which be made. Side of the aisle? Uh, well, I'm working with a supermajority. Democrats, I'd be more than happy. Uh, you maybe, if you saw the debate, Senator Rodonio and I are more than happy to work together. She appreciates the fact that we've been open, looking for compromises. They have, uh, they have the ability to offer amendments to the bill, the Senate bill. Uh, I'm open to any amendments that they want to offer. Uh, but in the meantime, I think we ought to pass a bill that. Uh, keeps the Chicago schools from having to lay off 3,000 teachers. There's been some talk that uh, a couple of senators who are close to the speaker got pulled off. It's not bill. true. Not true. Uh, those senators and other reasons to vote no, and I think we've convinced them to vote yes. Uh, the governor yesterday said 
pretty much on the budget that if it was just him and you negotiating, this would have been done weeks ago. But where does he come up with that? It's not negotiating with me on the budget. Yeah. That's why I'm here. I, I don't know what he's talking well, why about. Why aren't you guys in a room together? I think people don't understand. Do you want me to invite everybody into a room, or do you think the governor should do that? I think the governor ought to do that. I will go to any meeting the governor wants to call. Why don't you call a meeting? I could call a meeting, invite the governor, and say, Governor, what do you want to do? And the speaker. Can't you organize I'm sure, a meeting? I can get the speaker to come. The yeah. And then, if it's like the other meetings, we sit there and <laughs> the guy reads off a sheet of paper and nothing changes. Why are they not productive? Uh, I would say it's because the governor's not addressing these issues that I've addressed here uh, with the budget. That's the most important thing we do. He doesn't acknowledge that we've passed workers' comp reform. Uh, he doesn't talk about the inability to get me to support politically for these other changes. So that's what, that's what we're doing. But the budget's the most important thing we do because he ran on an idea of making us more competitive. That was one of his big, big talking points. And so, and a couple of his items, freezing property taxes, we're willing to talk about. Workers' comp reform, we're willing to do some more on that if we can. So we're open to that. Uh, I, I go to these meetings, and that's what I say to him. How long do you but think these are said more nuanced than he's appreciated. We're all going on without a budget now for, for three weeks. Everybody talks about a government shutdown, but we're not really feeling it too much That's now. because 60% of it has already been appropriated. Okay. When but, do you, when, but when you're, will it But you're, you're going to run out of money. These haven't been appropriated. The bottom part here, what's left, hasn't been appropriated, can't be spent. Medicaid providers are providing services, they're not, there's no authorization to pay them. So we have to pass an authorization. The budget is an authorization for the government to spend money. If we don't pass an authorization, he can't spend it. He's the one that vetoed it. So we have to go back and give him authorization to spend money. We're inviting him today to tell us how does he want to spend it. If he's got some ideas on how to save some money on stuff that's already being spent, tell us what they are. Not on constitutional pension reform bills. Uh, have somebody sponsor a bill that saves money on above the line there, I'd be happy to take it up. That's what we're here, to, here for. We're focused on the budget. Uh, it doesn't of you. seem like there's any incentive. I mean, if 60% of the budget is being paid, and you're not maybe getting pressure from the, the, the women who, you know, the moms who have disabled kids and aren't getting paid through Medicaid or however that's working, this could go on forever. I mean, and this well, whole... Well, it won't go on forever because there's going to be ramifications that may not be evident right now. But there's, there's a myriad of things that could happen. There, there, there's money that's owed, for example, to McCormick Place from the state that hasn't been appropriate. They could stop work on the expansion. We could start losing conventions. There's the downgrade, which I talked about, which I think is the most of the greatest concern. So uh, it's just focusing the fact that this is what we do. We pass budgets, and we appropriate money. And they have to be balanced. And if you don't have enough money, you've got to propose cuts or you've got to propose revenue. Any part of you fear that he doesn't want a budget until he gets everything he wants? Well, I mean, that's what he's starting off with, I guess. And I think that, he's, as I said, he need, he's admitted it. He's new at this. He hasn't done this before. Uh, and I don't think he's had the uh, background and the understanding of what these items are that he's even asking for. So that's what I think we have to do. We have to continue to meet to see if we can, we can educate him. And again, I'm always, always willing to listen to his arguments and see if there's a way to get support. This is a supermajority of Democrats and a bunch of pro-union Republicans in this state. This isn't, you know, Oklahoma or Kansas. And so he's got to understand he ran for governor in Illinois, and he's got to look at the realities of the legislature. Have you been no, alerted uh, that the bond rating agencies are getting close to downgrading us? Or are we going into the market again soon? Or? Reading the bond buyer from July 6th, they say in the next two months, uh, if they don't see any progress. You know, the bond uh, debt service is being paid, so they're looking at that and saying, well, bonds are being paid, but they downgrade um, if lawmakers are un unable to agree to a structural fix to an estimated $4 billion budget shortfall. That's what they said in the bond buyer. So I think it's uh, something that hopefully he'll, he'll understand that language. Just a couple more questions. What are you telling the people that's, what's, what's left? What are you telling the universities? Um, that we're 
that we passed the budget and the governor vetoed it. That doesn't help them, though. So what do they do? What, they well, we, we all have a role. Our role, we can't spend money. The governor spends money. We are not allowed to spend money. We don't procure anything. We only authorize. We've done that. He's vetoed. We're going to go back and do it again. We're asking him for advice on uh, what he wants to do. He proposed cutting higher ed by 31 percent. We cut by, I think, 6 percent, 6.5 percent. I, I couldn't do So we've already made cuts. We've already passed a responsible budget uh, for these areas, uh, but it's still not balanced. And we still have to go back and pass another uh, authorization. Mr. President, should the public be concerned that uh, macho or testosterone is involved here, that you guys just won't back down because you don't want to look like a punk? Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> Charles, we, you know, the Senate Democrats, we try to recruit women candidates <laughs> because we think that they're better candidates, they're uh, better candidates more women than, than, than us, and they tend to vote for women more than men vote for men. And we, uh, they make great senators and make great state representatives. So that's a good idea. Maybe we should start getting some more women in there. <laughs> now, I happen to think that I have testosterone, but I also think I'm willing to cooperate and work with the governor, and uh, I'm willing to do that and continue to do that. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate it.